Welcome back to Anatomy and Physiology on Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. In the previous video, we looked at the mechanism of regular breathing. So we talked about Boyle's Law. We went over how the thoracic diaphragm works and talked about pressures and volumes of the lungs and so on and so forth. Hopefully you understand that. And I mentioned that for quiet breathing, so let's say quiet inspiration, all that we require is just contraction of the thoracic diaphragm and then contraction of the external intercostal muscles. And then when we have quiet expiration, so just a regular breathing out whenever we're you know, just sitting on the couch or whatnot, all you have to do is relax the diaphragm and relax the external intercostals. There is no need when you're quietly breathing for any other muscles, and especially during the expiration, actually no muscles contract at all. In fact, you just have relaxation of the diaphragm and relaxation of the external intercostals. What we're gonna find is with forced ventilation, that is forced inspiration and forced expiration, we're gonna to have to recruit a lot more muscles. Now let's talk about, first of all, the difference between uh, forced breathing and quiet breathing. Well, quiet breathing was what you're doing when you're just sitting on your couch. You're not exerting yourself. You don't even think about breathing. You're barely even conscious of your breathing. Okay? Forced breathing is something that you do when you're exercising or if you're hyperventilating, having a panic attack. Hopefully that's not happening to you. Or, for example, when you go to the doctor's office and they put that stethoscope on your back and they ask you to take a deep breath in, well, obviously there you're breathing with a lot more force when you take that deep breath. Okay? That's forced inspiration. And then if they ask you to forcibly exhale, or if you're using a spirometer, which measures certain things, you do a forced expiration. So hopefully that makes sense with the difference between quiet and forced breathing. Okay? Now, when you do forced breathing, you're using a lot more force. In order to generate more force, the logical way to do that is to recruit more muscles. And so that's the thing we're gonna have to do. If we're gonna do forced breathing of any kind, you're gonna have to use more muscles. First, we're gonna talk about forced inspiration. So forced inspiration is basically when you take a deep breath. So again, um, whenever the doctors are listening to the activity in your thoracic cavity, whether it's your heart or your lungs, and they ask you to take a deep breath, that's forced inspiration. Okay. Or if you're going to go swimming, you're going to try to hold your breath underwater, you do a forced inspiration to try to get all that oxygen in. Okay. In order to do that, you have to recruit more muscles than just the diaphragm and the external intercostals. Now, you're still going to recruit those muscles. You may recruit more motor units and they may contract harder, but you're actually going to have some other muscles that play a role. And depending on what class you're doing, um, you may actually only see a few of these, but there's actually a lot more than this, um, and some of them play bigger roles than others. But I'll give you some examples. Um, there's a few of them that are gonna elevate the ribs and the sternum. So they're gonna pull the ribs upward just like the inter external intercostals do, and they may also pull the sternum upwards, okay? And pretty much what that does when you pull the sternum upwards is it actually draws the sternum a little bit anteriorly. Okay, so actually by pulling the sternum upwards, it'll actually be drawn anterior, anteriorly a little bit as well. And so not only are we going to be depressing the pleural membranes down, we're going to be lifting the ribs and sternum up and also drawing the sternum anteriorly. If you kind of think about these arrows, the directions, all three of those directions are going to increase the size of the thoracic cavity and allow the lungs to expand even more. So if we look at the subcostalis muscles, these are going to elevate ribs 6 through 8. Okay. Scalenes are going to elevate ribs 1 to 2. Pectoralis minor actually plays a role in elevating ribs 3 through 5. And then also the sternocleidomastoid muscle can actually elevate the sternum, and that will actually also help draw the sternum anteriorly. In fact, whenever the ribs are elevated, the sternum is drawn anteriorly by default. Okay. There is no muscle that just directly pulls the sternum anteriorly, but it turns out by elevating the ribs upwards, the sternum ends up getting drawn anteriorly by default. Okay. So not only during forced inspiration do you have to contract the diaphragm and external intercostals, you have to contract them harder, but also recruit some of these other muscles. And again, what the goal of this is, is to increase the size of the thoracic cavity even more above what it was during quiet inspiration. 
pull the ribs up more, pull the pleural membranes down more, draw the sternum anteriorly, and all of those things are going to increase the size of the thoracic cavity, allow the pressure in the lungs to drop even more, and allow more air to come in. In fact, what you should do right now is put your hands on your ribs and then take a big deep breath in. You should actually be able to feel your ribs expanding outward and your sternum actually going up a little bit. Okay, So hopefully that makes sense. One other thing I'll mention about forced inspiration is we can actually quantify it by determining something called an IRV. This is inspiratory reserve volume. Um, this varies pretty widely with people. It depends on a lot of factors, but average values are between 1900 and 3100 milliliters. And one thing we might want to do this for, for measuring IRV, is to measure a person's lung compliance. Lung compliance is the ease of lung expansion. So if lungs don't have compliance, then they're not able to expand very easily. Okay? They've lost their ability to expand or extend, as we might say. So if a lung can expand very easily, as we would expect in, let's say, in a, an elite endurance athlete, then they would have great lung compliance. And IRV could actually be a measure, indirect measure, of how compliant their lungs are. In some individuals, they can have a dramatic decrease in IRV, and this could, not necessarily, but it could indicate a disease called pulmonary fibrosis. And this is actually a condition where uh, you actually have damage to the lung tissue, and you have a bunch of uh, cells like fibroblasts that start depositing collagen. Collagen is non-contractile, and it's not extensible. So that means the lungs are not going to be able to expand as well. And this is a very bad disease state, and it affects how much you can actually breathe in. That, of course, affects how much oxygen you can get in. Okay, That's forced inspiration. Now let's talk about forced expiration. Now, forced expiration... This could be a number of things where you would see this. Um, of course, your expiration would be forced more if you're exercising heavily, if you're asked to blow out as hard as you can, which you might do at the doctor's office, or if you're measuring, let's say, your vital capacity on a spirometer, or even if you're just coughing or sneezing. That's a forced expiration. And again, just like in the case of forced inspiration, the way you get more force of expiration is to recruit more muscles. Now these are going to be a completely different set of muscles that we're going to see for forced expiration. Okay, So if I want forced expiration, I have to do a number of things. I need to actually make the thoracic cavity even smaller than it was. I got to bring it down in size so that the pressure goes up more and I can blow more air out. Okay, So I have to depress the ribs and sternum. I have to get the sternum and push it backwards or push it in a uh, uh, posteriorly. And then I got to get the pleural membranes back up. They got to elevate them. All those things, notice the direction of the arrows, are going to decrease the size of the thoracic cavity. And of course, we still have relaxation of the diaphragm. We still have relaxation of the external intercostals, but we have other things contracting. Now we have contraction of the internal intercostals. These are actually going to depress ribs 1 through 11, so pull those ribs down. There's also going to be a muscle called the transversus thoracis. This will actually depress ribs 4 through 7, and it will also pull the body of the sternum and the xiphoid process downward. Also, by doing these two things, by basically drawing the ribs downward and also the sternum, that also causes the sternum to be pushed backwards or posteriorly by default. Okay? The rest of these muscles down here, these are actually going to be abdominal muscles. The first one is the rectus abdominis. This is actually going to be the washboard muscle, the major uh, abdominal muscle that we usually think about. This is going to depress ribs 5 through 7 and also pull the xiphoid process of the sternum down. So it's also going to do a similar thing to these two muscles up here. Um, the external oblique muscles, those are also going to depress ribs 5 through 12. Okay, But... These two muscles right here and then these ones over here also have other functions. And that function is to compress the abdominal wall. So if you do a forced expiration, if you put your hands on your abdominal region and then forcibly exhale, you'll actually feel your abdominal muscles contract. Um, the way this works is actually by contracting the abdominal muscles, you actually increase the pressure inside the abdominal cavity. Okay. And by increasing the pressure inside the abdominal cavity, the abdominal cavity kind of pushes upward. Okay? Because if you're increasing the pressure in there, it'll kind of force the top of the cavity upward. And that will actually help force 
the bottom of the pleural cavity upward and that compresses the lungs, okay? And all four of these muscles do it. The rectus abdominis compresses the abdominal pelvic cavity. The external obliques compress the abdominal pelvic cavity. And then also, the abdominal wall is also compressed by two other muscles here. One's the internal obliques, and then we also have the transversus abdominis, okay? And so, again, the key with forced expiration, get more force so that you can exhale with more force, okay? So recruit more muscles. Again, with forced expiration, we can actually quantify this with an ERV. This is the expiratory reserve volume. We'll talk about this in a later video. And expiratory reserve volume doesn't really vary as much as IRV. We see that the ERV actually ranges between only about 1,100 to 1,200 milliliters. But this can also be a measure of lung elasticity. So when we think about elasticity, this is the ability to recoil. Okay? So what happens when you stretch a rubber band? Okay, when you stretch your rubber band, if you let go of it, it snaps right back to its original position. That's an example of elasticity. So with the lungs, they have the ability to expand. That's actually the lung compliance from inspiration, but they also should be able to recoil back to their original size. And if they can recoil back to their original size very well, that means the lungs have good elasticity. Okay? If the lungs have poor elasticity, meaning they have trouble recoiling, this could actually indicate emphysema. And what we would expect to see in someone with emphysema is a decrease in expiratory reserve volume. Okay? Um, we're not going to go into much with emphysema in this video, but in a future video, we'll actually look at um, some of the mechanisms of emphysema. Okay? But hopefully this video gave you a good understanding of how, first of all, forced ventilation differs from quiet ventilation or forced breathing, quiet breathing, and then also the added muscles that we're going to need for forced inspiration and forced expiration. All right? Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you very much.